Thank you for joining us for today's online talk, which will be starting shortly at 3 p.m. For those of you who are here early, thank you for waiting patiently. While you're waiting, we would like to share with you a short video from the firm. I founded the firm in September 1985 with the vision of seeking truth and justice for our clients and not just winning their cases. Over the years, the team has achieved many significant milestones. We are today recognized the firm in September 1985. Asia law law vision of seeking truth and justice legal for business our clients as they recognize we need their cases in various practice areas. Over the years, while the we have embraced the technology many significant services, efficient and responsive, we are today recognized by the, the growth of the bedrock of meticulous Asia law profiles and the Asian legal business, which is really recommended as a firm. In various as legal practice areas, becomes increasingly while we have embraced technology to make our services efficient and responsive with our relationship, we continue to grow on our bedrock of meticulous our firm is a founding member of a legal which is really no doubt international as legal practice becomes increasingly international Asian we keep ourselves ahead of the curve with our relationship in buyers around the world to protect and flow is a founding member of the team of this by holding the flow into our bad international integrity and justice a law firm while keeping our best to deliver effective and efficient solutions we believe instead of just having with our clients we protect us on our global working relationships. We achieve this by understanding to our values of integrity and justice, while giving our best to deliver professional and efficient solutions. We are keen to Instead of just legal services, we focus on developing great working relationships based on understanding and respect. With our core firm invests in responsibility and emphasizes professional development. Passion for the law and enjoy our knowledge. And this brings out our heart. In us, on our clients, and to they also to give back. We regularly advise foreign clients, including many Chinese investors, and have a ready appreciation for different ways of doing business. In corporate matters, we offer relevant and commercial solutions, often raising issues that clients may or may not have realized before. We regularly advise foreign clients, we believe in including many Chinese investors, and have a ready appreciation for different ways of doing business. In corporate matters, we offer relevant and commercial Good afternoon, welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us for, our, for today's online talk title, Punjana Incentives for Property Sector, RPGT and Stamp Duty Reliefs. My name is Anissa Haimi. I'm an associate with Mao and Kain Associates and I will be your moderator for today's session. Before we start today's talk, allow me to introduce the firm and what we do. Mao and Kain Associates is a mid-sized law firm that was founded in 1985 by Dato Mao and Kai. Our ABLE team today comprises 22 lawyers and support team of 19. Dato Ma is a consultant with the firm following his retirement from the Court of Appeal bench in 2015. The firm continues its tradition today of working primarily with small medium enterprises, family businesses, and individuals. We are a full service law firm with four departments, namely corporate, dispute resolution, including litigation, adjudication, and arbitration, a dedicated employment team, and a department focused on servicing the needs of individuals and families. Our firm also has five practice groups, and these practice groups indicate some of our focus areas, which are supported by talents from both our corporate and dispute resolution teams. Today's talk is part of our MWKA online talk series. By way of background, we have been organizing monthly launch talks at our office since 2013, some of which were also broadcasted live. But with the COVID-19 movement control order, we have moved online in order to continue with our objective of sharing knowledge, raising awareness, and encouraging networking for clients, potential clients, and in-house counsel. Today is the 22nd talk in MWKA online talk series, and we are expecting about 170 people. Please visit our website at mawinkai.com for more information, to read our articles, and to sign up for more upcoming talks. Before I continue, please be reminded that this talk does not constitute legal advice, and in the event you require specific legal advice to your matter, please contact us for our complimentary legal consultation. We will leave our details with you at the end of this talk. Next, allow me to introduce you to our two speakers for today. Our first speaker is one of our partners, Ms. Sarah Kambali, who leads the Real Estate Practice Group, as well as our Sharia Estate Planning Team. Sarah holds a Bachelor of Laws degree from the International Islamic University of Malaysia 
and also holds a postgraduate diploma in Sharia law and practice from UITM. She was admitted to the Malaysian Bar in 2007. Sarah's practice areas involve real estate transactions such as drafting sale and purchase agreements, tenancy agreements, as well as Sharia estate planning, which involves drafting and advocating wills under Islamic law. Sarah is also a member of the conveyancing committee, both of the Sango Bar and the KL Bar. Our next speaker is Marcus Leong. Marcus is an associate in our real estate department. He graduated from the University of West England with a Bachelor of Laws and has also obtained a Master of Commercial Law from Unis University Malaya since then. Marcus was called to the Malaysian Bar in 2018 and his areas of practice include preparing sale and purchase agreements, loan documentation and transfer of property. Our speakers aim to complete today's talk by 3.45 p.m. and conclude with a Q&A session. So if you have any questions, please don't forget to post them up on our Slido or in the chat <clears throat> um, and we will address them later. You should have received a link to Slido during registration, but I will leave this slide up for you so you can scan the QR code before we move on. Alternatively, you can go to Slido's website webpage and key in the code 48613. I repeat 48613 and this is indicated in just below the QR code before you now. So without further ado, as we are all aware, we are facing unprecedented times due to the COVID-19 outbreak and the country has gone through many phases. So now we are at the phase of recovery and the government has rolled out a few um, initiatives and one of which is the Punjana to help the country in terms of economic growth. So today our speakers will address that in relation to the following top points, namely property market outlook for term 2020 and 2021, real property gain tax, the relief for residential sellers, home ownership campaign, the reintroduction and mechanics, wave or uplift of the 70% margin loan during HOC, home ownership campaign. I pass the floor to you, Sarah. Good afternoon, everyone. Assalamualaikum. Thank you very much, Anis, for the introduction. I shall share my slide now. Give me one moment, yeah? All right. As you all know that um, due to the COVID-19, there's a lot of uh, commercial economic downturn of our country. So for today, we are going to talk about how this plan Jana Semula Ekonomi Negara uh, short-term economy recovery plan, Penjana in short, is being uh, rolled out uh, in terms of for real estate purposes. So allow me to first uh, show you, if you look at the, the slide right now, our main source, if you see there, is uh, the text for Japan, which is the speech given by our Prime Minister Tan Sri Datu Aji Muhammad Yassin, our Prime Minister for the Penjana on 5th of June, which is last month. Um, and also the booklet that was uh, already out by the Treasury uh, and the source, can, you can find it in uh, the source code that pinjana.treasury.gov.my Okay, uh, for your uh, purposes, this is actually, a, how do you say, an announcement by the PM, not a gazette. So what does this mean? This means that Anything that we are sharing right now is based on the announcement of the Prime Minister and it's not based on the Gazette. Gazette is an announcement by the government itself um, and it is being used uh, legally uh, and basically in all real estate transactions, we rely on the Gazette. So if you go to any law firm, when, they ask, uh, when you ask about them about the Punjana, they will explain the same thing that we are going to explain now, but with the... With the um, caveat, uh, you know, because there's no gazette. Okay, so first and foremost, allow me to share with you the property market outlook. So what I've done is that I've gone to NAPIC, uh, basically this portal, uh, the government uh, JPPH portal, Jabatan Penilaian Artana Punya portal, and in that portal you will find a lot of these uh, snapshots. Of, or, or rather comparisons and contrast of all the property market. Uh, I'm sure you guys can see here. So if you see at the, let me just have a pointer at least so that you can, I can show you where I'm looking at. So if you see here, uh, the volume and value of properties transaction is going from uh, quarter one, quarter one is uh, from January to March. 
uh, quarter one 2019 in comparison with quarter one 2020. So you see um, the volume and transaction of units of sale of purchase transaction. This is not a transaction of um, transfer. Okay, this is basically to try to sell. And if you look at it, the units, it is going down. So the, the, the residential, commercial, industrial, agriculture development. So it does go down up to much, I guess, due to the fact that there's a lot of um, uncertainties, political outbursts and um, changes. And um, yeah, th there's a lot of those things going on. So everything is a negative, nothing is positive. Yeah, so this is the first quarter. We are now actually on the third quarter. Yeah, but this is the first quarter and the value transaction is based, this is based on billion, yeah. So the first quarter is this much, it does go down. It's going down because, let's just face it, there's a lot of um, halangan, you know, with uh, a stoppage for people to sell and for people to buy. In, in 2018, before 2019 hit, this, if you see this is quarter one 2019, right? So before 2019, Anyone who's selling the property, they do not have issues of real property gain tax uh, to be paid after five years. Okay, starting 1st January of 2019, that's where real property gain tax is at a minimum for individuals and Malaysians and PR at 5% for the uh, gain that they get. So um, previously, after five years, there was no nothing except for company company has five percent that time before 2019 hit but now 2019 five percent for um malaysians and pr uh, whereas 10 percent for foreigners and 10 percent for companies so that's quite a lot yeah that's quite a lot all right so other than that this is this the five top states this is all by the government jpbh jabatan uh Penilaian, Perumahan, yeah? they have gathered information and data and this is the uh, states, five states with residential overhang means those are the, the properties that are really not being sold right now and apartments that overhang as well, okay? All right, um, other than that, the construction for residential, all these types of properties, yeah, it is also not really that uh, great in terms of, if you look at their, their, um, their trend, if you look, if I may, yeah, residential is all right, but this is for the ones that being built, not being sold, yeah, but overhang and sold is here, all right, I don't know who did this, but all right, <laughs> okay, so this is the property market, all right, for now, of course, um, after looking into the uh, a lot of sources and a lot of other data other than the government's data, we do record we do concede that there is a go growing um, or rather going from going down. Everything that goes down must go up, right? So it is coming up slowly, and it should recover by twenty twenty one. But still, properties are not something that will go down and uh, not with value. It might go down slightly. As you can see, it's, it's not like more than 50% 50, 50 or 50, you know, the pointers. So you, you should not, you know, I mean, it's, it's a good time to buy. And um, well, sell, I'm not so sure about good time to buy. But with the panjana, uh, there, there is why based on this uh, data that has been collected, the penjana comes in, which uh, is supposed to assist uh, those sellers, entice more sellers to sell the property, okay? And also to get all this overhang and those properties that are going, uh, not going anywhere, you know, buying and selling. Yeah, that's why the home ownership campaign is also being revived, all right? So without any further ado, let me share with you uh, the next page, yeah. So in for the first thing in Panjana, so what is whenever I say Panjana means that that booklet or rather in that booklet booklet doesn't have only for real estate. There's a lot of other uh, tax reliefs, other plans that government has come up with to ensure that we are able to um, we are able to proceed with a commercial. Uh, 
transactions and we try to entice more sellers to sell property. So one of it would be this real property gain tax uh, relief, uh, basically an exemption for residential sellers. Uh, this means that your title or the master title or the SMP sale and purchase agreement must be one of the Schedule G or Schedule H for master title matters. For individual title, it must mention residential. So it, if it's like, uh, for example, you might be asking about what about Soho, Soho, all those kind of mixed development. So you have to look at the strata of the title. If the strata of the title mentions residential, then you're safe. Okay, you're safe because if it says commercial, you can't use uh, you can't you can't use the exemption. Okay, there's a few more things, but let us go to what is exactly a real a real property gain tax. So real property gain tax is an imposition of tax on chargeable gains. Okay, let's say you bought the property uh, last five years ago about two hundred thousand, for example, and this year you're selling it at four hundred thousand. So there's a gain of two hundred thousand. So that gain of two hundred thousand, that is the one that you're going to be charged of tax. Yeah. So this is governed under the Real Property Gain Tax Act, nineteen seventy six, and it is a government's tool to curb market speculation. So we do not want a situation where um, properties are being uh, used as a tool to, to manipulate market value of, the, uh, of, of outside the transaction. So government has used RPGT, real property gain tax, as a way of to curbing that, okay? So the percentage of the chargeable gains uh, for every transaction real property gain tax differs from each, in, uh, each, each person or each uh, um, Entity, I would say, because there would be an entity of individual with the status of being a Malaysian or a permanent resident. Whenever I see permanent resident, I'll, I'll also say PR, yeah, or a non Malaysian foreigner or a disposal by company. All right, so every each of these entities has different rates, yeah. For example, I've given you the example prior to 2019, there's no chargeable rate for all uh, Malaysians and PR, but um, after that, there is. So let me bring you down to memory lane a bit um, before we move on, yeah. So if you look at the screen, yeah, this is the table that we've conjured up. So this is for individuals, Malaysian and PR. They always lump Malaysian and PR together. So if you look into this, I, I won't go one by one, but you guys can look while I'm, while I'm, while I'm giving you the talk. Yeah, so the first year, second year, third year, usually they clump together, first two years or first three years. Yeah, this one, first two years. Earlier of the stages is first two years, yeah. Later on, it became first three years, uh, and then fourth year, and then after five years, you know, that kind of thing. So um, it started off like this, all right? The, if you look at the, the percentage, this is percentage on gains, yeah, on gains. Means that the first year in, in 1995, we did that, that bracket of years, is 30% from gains. If you sell, you buy a property and then you sell it within that first year, it's 30%. As you can see, I lived through this uh, era as well. When I was, I just started my uh, pupillage and I became a lawyer around this time. So I did um, get to see this era as well, 2008, 2009, whereby there was no gain, uh, there's no chargeable gain. So it's all 0%. So you do not, they didn't abolish it, but it was 0%. Okay. And then comes 2010, of course, all this era I'm in lah, obviously. So 2010, um, everything became 5% for individuals and Malaysians and PR, yeah? So this is all Malaysians and UPR. You have a look at it. So we are here now. There's no changes in 2019 and 2020. How do you know if there's changes? You always listen and keep an eye out for budgets. So budget uh, announcements are where you get exemptions for RPGT and also exemptions for STEM. I'm, I'm sure many of you know that, but for those who do not know, I'm just sharing this with you, yeah? So this is Malaysians and PR, okay? So next is for uh, individuals, non-Malaysians or rather foreigners when they own the property and they have to pay taxes. So this is the memory lane of it. It's also 0% at that time. 2008 and 2009, it was heaven to sell properties. There was no uh, real property gain tax. But um, after that, it was zero up till 2013. 2014, they started. And up to now, it's still 5%. Okay. All right. So this is the individuals. But you can see um, for 
non Malaysians and foreigners, 2019, it's 30% all the way, all right? 30% all the way. Uh, there's no 10 or 15% anymore. It's all 30% all the way, okay? Up to a point where everything's 5% after five years, okay? Then we come to company. So this is company. If you look at the company's um, trend, unlike foreigners, they, there is a 20% 50% from the chargeable gains, but um, in 2018, it was 5%, then it rose to 10%. Okay, 2019 and 2020, it still maintained that way, all right? Other than that, again, I say everything is 0% here. It was very interesting. Um, interesting for lawyers too. We don't have to submit any further documents at this area, this era. So yeah, I remember that as well. Then the kappa kappa are trying to get back to the groove of submitting the CKHD forms. No, what to do? So if government has imposed and they started imposing some more later. Okay, then we summarize it from 2019 onwards. So our firm had, had actually had this out in our uh, website uh, and we do share this information for easy reference yeah so basically first three years of acquisition we put it in all one companies is 30 percent individual 30 percent individual citizen and permanent resident is 30 percent and then we have non-citizens which is 30 percent all same it differs when you go down and 20 percent and the foreigners still 30 percent this is the one i said doesn't matter how many years, it's after five years, they enjoy 5% only. 5% in companies is 10%. So you have a look. Basically, companies and individual citizen PR is the same, okay? It's just difference in after five years, how many, and well, foreigners is the percent citizens and 5%, okay? So this is on chargeable gain. It's not on the purchase price or the value, yeah? It's on chargeable gains. That's why it's for property gain tax. Now, this is where I come to Penjana. So Penjana here, if you look into it, that this is how the booklet, the booklet, um, there's lots of pages of the booklet. So this booklet, when you do find it in the source that I've given there, um, you look into page 44, if I'm not mistaken. Give me one second because I can't see from here. Um, yeah, page 44, correct. So you go to penjana.treasury.gov.my and you can look into this. This is for specifically for real estate matters. Okay, I will be uh, sharing with you this, uh, the one that's very highlighted in the box, yeah? Whereas my colleague Marcus will be sharing about the HOC and also the uh, update or the wave of 70% of loan. Um, also based on whatever that, the, the, the TNC of the banks, yeah. So, anyways, the pengecualian cukai keuntungan hartanah, which is the exemption of real property gain tax. So, it was announced. It is given to individuals. Uh, it says the individuals warga negara Malaysia, uh, which means the Malaysians, all right, um, on the pelupusan rumah kediaman, uh, disposal of uh, residential houses. Uh, it doesn't matter condo, apartment, as long as it's residential, okay, it's deemed residential. And uh, the SMP sale and purchase agreement or the, the disposal of it must be dated from 1st of June 2020, which is last month, up to 31st December in 2021, okay. So this is the timeline that this uh, exemption is given. So the best part of it is that uh, each of these individuals who are Malaysians are able to enjoy this exemption without using their once in a lifetime exemption, yeah, uh, for three houses that they want to dispose. Okay, this is a big deal. Okay, this is a big deal to a lot of Malaysians, a lot of people, because it helps um, to curb whatever the, the extra costs that the, the, the vendors might, the sellers might uh, incur in terms of real property gain tax. Instead of paying the taxes of 5% from the chargeable gain, you get to enjoy this 5%, meaning that you don't have to pay, right? But I am also sharing this with a very, very huge caution because even the real property gain tax department in in the uh, IRB, yeah, the the Re in, uh, revenue board there, Inland Revenue Board, they also give the caution to wait for the gazette. 
okay? I was kind of hoping that when we are doing this, we, do, we already have the guests that unfortunately we don't. Yeah, but we are here to give the, share the knowledge that this is what is given. So the Gazette, how can a difference of Gazette make it? It, 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 still, it could backtrack. It backtracks to your first June 2020, no problem. But the issue is whether, um, does it really confine to Warga Nagara Malaysia only? Is it only Malaysians? Does it include PR? Because uh, following the trend, all the other um, budget uh, announcements and all the other um, exemptions, they include Malaysians and PR, okay, that's where one. They don't include foreigners, uh, so, but it, the Gazette might just allow foreigners, uh, we don't know, I'm not sure, I'm not saying that, but I'm just saying that we don't know what's on the Gazette, yes, it says Malaysian, but this is a Panjana, Panjana is more towards plan, not, it's, it's like, if you're, uh, if you're planning to do something, you sign with an, another party, an MOU, where there's no real, uh, it's 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 a plan, but it's not something that is is workable. I mean, it's workable. Is how do I say? It? Like it's it's not it's not something that uh, the other parties will take note of. So with a gazette, the Inland Revenue Board, the Real Property Gain Tax Departments, they will make sure that this pengecualian, um, this exemption, is is used yeah it's, it's in force and another thing that uh, might be different is it says rumah kediaman and it doesn't say whether or not within the first year the second year the third year or fourth year or after five years you know so we really need to wait for the gazette uh, we don't know how the mechanism of how many years uh, is allowed to use this three times exemption within this period of time okay so if you look into this this is a lampiran uh, additional with the panjana you will find it in this panjana treasury yeah and it explains that three houses and it says that rumah kediaman yeah the housing cannot be through transfer of love and affection okay love and affection doesn't include uh, in this um, exemption okay uh, it must be of sale and purchase, right? Okay, so this is the explanation to it, right? But just a comment, like how we mentioned here, unlike the home ownership campaign, which my clique will be uh, presenting later, this exemption is more towards the sub-sale, yeah, secondary market, uh, not towards a developer's sale, yeah? So it's something to boost the sales but again those are the uncertainties that only a gazette can um, really answer the questions okay so with that i am going to stop my share today and i hope you guys are able to have a clearer view if there's any questions i will be able i, I i'll definitely uh answer them at the end of the talk yeah all right, uh, over to you, Marcus. Okay, Sarah. I'll share my slide right now. All right. Okay, welcome everybody. Uh, so I'll be talking on this uh, home ownership campaign. Uh, we call it the HOC, the reintroduction. Reintroduction because uh, it was here last year and now they are reintroducing it. Okay. Um, all right, so basically the aim of the HOC is to encourage and support home buyers who are looking to purchase a property and to boost the sales of the unsold properties in Malaysian housing market. So just now, um, Sarah has showed uh, this table where there are still a lot of uh, hanging properties, we call it, which is uh, unsold by the developers. And so this HOC is to encourage them to, to purchase these properties. Okay, so... Uh, at first, this uh, HOC was uh, targeted to run from 1st January to 30th June 2019. But it was extended until the end of last year, 31st December 2019, announced by our Housing and Local Government Minister, Zuraida Kamarudin. So it ended in um, 
31st December 2019. So from January 2020 this year, there was no uh, HOC anymore. But then our Prime Minister reintroduced it starting from 1st June. So he introduced this uh, in the Panjana uh, as one of the incentives to boost our nation's uh, businesses and economy. So without the HOC, our current uh, stamp duty rates are like this in this table. So uh, 1% for first 100,000 and then followed by 2% and 3% of 500,000 to 1 million, and above 1 million, it will be 4%. And uh, this is the page uh, in the Panjana, where it states that this HOC will be introduced for properties between 300,000 to 2.5 million. So we have summarized the requirements in here. So the conditions for the exemption is has to be an instrument signed between 1st June 2020 to 31st May 2021 and the developer has to grant a discount of at least 10% and uh, it is for residential properties only. Take note, it's only residential. Price between 300,000 and 2.5 million and it only applies to the registered properties listed developers within the scheme and purchases must be Malaysian citizens. Okay, we go back a little bit. Okay, so this was from uh, the Panjana website as well. So the Panjanjan Jobly, which is the SMP, must be signed between the buyer and the developer, which is registered with Reda, Shareda, and Sheda. And it must be dated between 1st June 2020 to 31st May 2021. And this was mentioned just now, the 10% discount must be given by the developer and the purchaser has to be a Malaysian citizen. Okay, and this stamp duty exemption, for MOT, it will be exemption on the first 1 million of the purchase price, and for loan agreement, it will be full exemption. So for example, if the property is more than 1 million, maybe 1.5 million, so the 500,000 will be uh, subjected to this 3% stamp duty still without any exemption. Okay, so this is the example uh, I've prepared here. Uh, it's a comparison between HOC and without HOC for property at a price of 1.2 million. So if you can see without HOC, the first um, 100,000 will be 1%, as mentioned just now, followed by 2%, 3%, and 4%. So the total stamp duty to be paid is 32,000. But then if there's HOC, the first 1 million will be exempted. And then the amount more than 1 million is only subjected to 3% instead of the 4% in without HOC. Okay. And next, uh, there is also uh, an uplift of this 70% loan margin introduced by the Prime Minister in the Punjana as well. So basically, um, it says... 70% margin of financing limit applicable for third housing loan onwards for property value at 600,000 and above will be uplifted. Basically, it means normally when we borrow loan for purchase of uh, properties, the first loan is common to expect a 90% loan to be approved, uh, especially when it's the individual's first housing loan. But then... Um, Bank Nagara closely regulates the loan-to-value ratios, we call it LTV ratios, for housing loans to prevent uncontrolled speculation. So normally the second housing loan, will, people will get paid maybe 80% and the third will be kept at 70% uh, if the individual has two or more existing housing loans. So right now, uh, what the uplifting means, it means... Uh, this 70% will, uh, will not be uh, kept anymore, means that individuals might get more than 70% loan for the third housing loan onwards for property value at 600,000 and above uh, during this period of the HOC. But then at the end of the day, this is all subject to the internal risk management practices of your banks or financial institutions. 
So they still have to do a test to test the risk uh, before giving that more than 70% loan financing to you. All right, so um, that's all for my part. So right now we are in this uh, Q&A uh, session. Anis, uh, maybe I can pass it back to you to the Stido page. Thank you, Sarah and Marcus, for sharing with us. We will now take questions from participants from Slido. Just a second while I share the screen. So does anyone have any questions to post? I saw a few hands were raised during the talk. I think this question is for both of you. Um, when will we estimate get when will we estimate that the gadget to have these two out? Sarah, so you wanna take it or <laughs> can you guys answer? <laughs> Okay, uh, I'll, I'll take this. Lah. Okay, so basically what uh, Sarah is doing every day is to refresh the Gazette page to see whether it's out or not. We have been waiting, to be honest, uh, since the announcement by the PM, but until now we still haven't uh, received anything or the Gazette is not still not out yet. We do not, we do not know when, but whenever we call uh, the relevant bodies to check, they will only say uh, it's, they are preparing it. Yeah, so that's the situation for now. And we are doing this talk based on the PM's announcement. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, just to add on that, um, the, the trend of gazettes are usually quite, depends on how um, important or very vital the situation is, uh, a necessity if, if it, it is, it's like, um, how when all of us went into uh, MCO, right? 18th of March, we started MCO and what is not necessity, not deemed necessity, everything must be closed, right? So I, I, I think this gazette is still not out because it's not so much of a necessity, although it boosts the economy, but it doesn't seem like a necessity since they're not rushing for it. It's been a month. Um, you can hear from my voice and my face, I'm trying not to, so I'm so frustrated because a lot of people are asking about this gazette, so yeah. Okay, that's that. So the next question I think is for Marcus. For waste or uplift of 70% loan margin, does it apply only for residential properties? How about commercial properties? All right, thank you, Anis. So based on the Panjana, uh, it says 70% uh, margin of financing limit is applicable for the third housing loan onwards. So uh, I think it only applies to housing loan. Um, and um, I, I could add on that, it's actually on also on home ownership campaign uh, because it also borderlines on the 70% uplift for that campaign. So it's, it um, ties back to that, yeah. Okay, so I think the next another question for you, Sarah. Before Punjana is gazetted, when the sale is completed, should the seller still pay to LHDN, the RPGT, and a new homeowner buyer to still pay the stamp duty? Okay, for the RPGT, right, um, for now, because there's no gazette, uh, we would advise uh, that the 3% still be retained and be paid. Uh, what happens is, let's just go backtrack. When you sign a sale and purchase agreement, you need to, the purchaser lawyers have to retain a 3% for locals uh, and PRs to, this is called retention sum, to be paid to the RPGT department, the IRP. Um, but in cases where, you know, you use your once in a lifetime exemption or there is such an exemption like this, then that 3% can be waived off as soon as you get the notice saying that there's no um, payment to be made. So it just retain and not paid, you know, and then can release back to the vendor. Lah. But uh, and you, to know further, you can ask your lawyers about this. Um, but for this, I would suggest simply because if you do not pay the 3%, yeah, if the vendor decide, okay, never mind, let's just, let's just take it off, lah, the 3%, yeah, just give it to me, I'll, I'll, you have to get, uh, to inform the vendor that if, let's say, uh, RPGT for Punjana or anything of that sort, this, like I said, the three houses, you don't, uh, it, it's residential, but you do not know um, if it's within five years, after six years, after 10 years. We don't know what's the, uh, basically, I don't think it's after 10 years, lah, but yeah, you, you get the drift. So if that doesn't apply and you didn't pay the 3%, you are going to be penalized yeah, because you didn't pay the retention sum. Okay, so the penalization, I mean, the, 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 the late 
penalty is quite high depending on you know, the purchase price. As for the stamp duty, uh, Marcus, I think that is for you, but um, more towards home ownership campaign. So you need to make the payment. Um, how do you pay for HOC previously? It was like we have to pay in advance anyways, right? Okay, because uh, we have this uh, form to be stamped by Reda. So if we couldn't get the form beforehand, we have to pay first and then we'll have to ask for a refund from LHDN using the form. Yeah. But right now, if you can get the form before and then we can show the form to LHDN and then uh, they will just waive the stamp duty. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, next question for you again, Marcus. Once gazetted on stamp duty, if it's a joint name and 50% is a foreigner, how would that be calculated? All right, for stamp duty, there is no difference between uh, whether you are a local or a foreigner. So the calculation will still be the same. This difference for foreigners is uh, only applicable for, uh, in this uh, RPGT, there will be a difference. Yeah, for stamp duty, it will still be the same, uh, which is waived for amount below 1 million and above 1 million will be 3%. Okay, another question. Um, the HOC doesn't apply to properties below 300,000. So does that mean developers for properties below 300,000 are not mandated to give 10% discount, Marcus? All right, for this question, um, developers has uh, this, it is their choice now whether to give this uh, discount or not, but then if it's not HOC, then I don't think they, they will give any discount because it doesn't uh, make any sense anyways because HOC is only for properties uh, above 300,000. Uh, <clears throat> so I don't think uh, it's mandatory for developers to give any discount if it's below 300,000, it's entirely up to them. Anything okay. to add on this, uh, Sarah? Well, if... if um... For me, I'll just add that this discounting is all part and parcel of the marketing strategy of a developer. So it, it never is a mandatory thing, but it becomes an appealing factor if you actually have a property that is under some sort of a discount. Um, and HOC boosts that uh, for the, you know, the developer can still say, I don't want to give the 10% discount. So there's no HOC application there and stamp duties is is to be paid in full yeah but of course who would go and buy that kind of properties if the hoc is not applicable that that's the marketing strategy so it's not really mandated it's more of how you strategize okay thank you for that sarah i think we have our last question here how to ascertain 10 percent discount is it in the smp agreement I think that's a question for you, Marcus. Oh, all right. Okay. So this 10% uh, discount uh, will be, I think it will be given, uh, it will be listed in this uh, booking form. I'm not sure whether they will include this in the SMP agreement or not. But then one thing for sure is that they will issue a letter to state all the discounts. For example, uh, what uh, one of the developers did you know, last time. So they will not put this in the SMP agreement. They will issue a separate letter to state that how much discount has been given or in, in the booking form as well. Yeah, so it doesn't have to be in the SMP agreement. Okay. I think we're right on time. We finished right on the dot 3.45 p.m. Um, so thank you, um, Sarah and Marcus, for your insights. But before we conclude, I have a few announcements to make. Um, allow me to just get share screen. First, um, please join us again for our upcoming talks. So on Monday, the 20th of July, 29th of July, our associate Janessa Kok, along with our pupil Ryan Chong, will be sharing their insights on drink driving apprentices in Malaysia. Secondly, please fill in our feedback form and tell us what you thought of our talk. The link to the form will be posted in the chat. We appreciate your comments so that we can continue to improve our services for you in the future. I'll leave this on um, just for you to scan for a while. Thirdly, please do follow or like our social media accounts. The link has been posted in the chat. Fourthly, if you would like to speak with our lawyers, we offer a complimentary 30-minute consultation over the phone or over video conference. Please fill in the form on our website. The link is also posted in the chat box. So I saw that just as we were about to leave the Q&A session, there was a question that came up. So maybe you can um, drop us 
uh, your question um, by using this form and, one of, and Sarah and Marcus will get to you after, after the talk. And finally, to our guests, thank you for joining us. We hope you have found today's session informative and useful. Thank you.